It is uh, it is a blessing to be here. As, as uh, Pastor Louis was telling you, my wife is unable to be here. She wanted to be here, but uh, yeah, considering uh, what she had done on on Friday, uh, she was not able to be with us. Uh, actually, you know, it's, it's weird because it's not the first day that the most swelling occurs. It's actually two days later that the most swelling Amen. occurs. So, Amen. but uh, but she's doing she's doing well, and she's looking forward to seeing this, and she's looking forward to being uh, being with us again uh, if the Lord allows me the opportunity, and I know that He will. Uh, it is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord. Wonderful to be spending time with you again. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to this, and I believe that that the Lord truly and sincerely has a word for us today. I'm going to ask you quickly just to go with me to uh, to First uh, Timothy, First Timothy, chapter chapter six. I'm going to be reading from the ESV. You can read from you know whatever you're reading from is fine. It's just. But, uh, but I just want to let you know I'm going to be reading from the ESV. We're going to end up in the same place regardless. Amen. First Timothy chapter 6, and I'm going to be reading from the second part of verse 2, or I will call it 2B through 10. And if you have it, say I have it. And if I'm just going to ask you if you're able to stand, stand with me. Amen. Not, not for me, not for me, but just to honor uh, the word of the Lord. Amen. Honor the living God. Amen. If you're able to stand, stand with me just for a moment. And the word of the Lord says, teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy and dissension and slander and evil and suspicion and constant friction among people who are depraved in the mind and deprived of truth imagining that godliness is a means of gain oh, we know where this is going huh this is like man this is some heavy stuff but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into the world and we could not take anything out of the world but if we have food and clothing, these will be the, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Pray with me for a moment. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Yes, God. Father, I pray and I know that you will glorify your name through this word today. Yes, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, would, would minister to us personally through your word of truth today. Ultimately and in all things, Father, that your name would be glorified. Speak to us, open our ears and our hearts, Father, and, and dear Lord, use this instrument today. Use, uh, use my lips, my words today, Father, to glorify your name. Yes. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I don't want to take up, you may be seated. I don't want to take up too much of your time today, but I do want to share with you a word. And I want to give you a little bit of background here from my perspective. I want full disclosure. I, I come from... Uh, from a background where I saw some things that, that, that the Holy Spirit had to deal with me about, things that I, I was not comfortable with seeing. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that we are in a time, we are in a, in a moment right now in the church where there are many people that are seeking the truth. But, it, you know, the fact of the matter is that, that the church, for the most part, is the doors are closed. So people are going to Facebook. People are going to to YouTube, people are, are looking through different mediums to find the truth. I believe that it is our responsibility to know what true doctrine is, what true teaching, the true teaching of the word is. And, and, and that's why I, I wanna bring this word. I've had a few people that have come to me and, and have been excited about, about people that they have heard. And, and maybe a year ago, they would have never looked at YouTube for a message, but because of what's going on, 
They want to know the truth. They want to hear the truth. Where do they go? Where do they go? I believe that this is a perfect place for them to be. But they need to hear sound teaching. They need to hear sound truth. And it is, it is, it is a twofold responsibility. The, the responsibility of the, uh, the discipler, of the teacher, but it is also the responsibility of the, the one that is being the di discipled to discern the truth, to know what is true. So today, I bring to you a word that's called following sound doctrine and filtering out false doctrine. And listen, this is not... I'm not going to be talking to you today about, about Peter uh, walking on the water, okay? <laughs> I, I would have loved to have brought something like that. It's, it is, uh, it's just a little easier to bring a story of faith in such a way. But today I just really want to, I want to challenge you so that when you speak to people uh, or that when people come to you and, and they know that you're that church person, you're Miss Church Lady or, or you're Mr. Church Man and and they're coming to you and they're excited and they, when they begin to talk to you about certain and specific uh, things that they hear that you're able to discern what is truth. And, and if it's not, you're able to say, you know what, that's, you, you may want to be careful with that. You, you may want to consider what you're listening to because not everything that sounds good is good. Amen. Amen? So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, to uh, pose four questions and I want to answer those four questions. What time is it? I want to answer those four questions for you today. The first one is, very simply, what is sound doctrine? What is sound teaching? The second question, for those of you who are writing, I'll slow down a little bit. What is sound doctrine? The second question is this. Why is it important to identify false doctrine? Why is it important for, for me to understand what false teaching is and false doctrine is? I mean, after all, I'm receiving good doctrine. I'm receiving good teaching, so, so what do I need to know about that stuff? It's important. Number three, how can I identify a false teacher? How, how do I identify that false teacher so that when someone speaks to me or when I am listening, I can immediately notice or, or immediately discern that this person is not, not everything that, that it appears to be or she appears to be. And number four, what is the fruit or the result of sound drop doctrine? So if I am receiving sound doctrine, what should it look like? So what is the fruit or the result of sound doctrine? Amen. So those are the four questions that I want to address, and I want to address them quickly. So what the first one is what is sound doctrine? Well, sound doctrine is the teaching, is teaching that is supported by scripture and taught in context to the truth of Jesus Christ. It is taught in the context of the truth of Jesus Christ. It's not simply saying the word Jesus or, or talking about Jesus, but putting into the, it, it into the context of Scripture correctly, Amen. rightly dividing the Word of God. So any teaching that is based upon God's Word, but taken out of its intentional meaning, is false teaching. So, so let me give you an example, a practical example in my life. Everybody that really knows me, everybody that really knows me knows that I love, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not into a lot of different sweets. I mean, I like my Krispy Kreme donuts. I just want to let you know. I, it, but when it comes to cake, I'm not, you know, I mean, I, I'll eat myself some chocolate cake. I, I don't want you to think that I wouldn't because if it's there, I'm going to consume it. But anybody that knows me knows that I love, I love carrot cake. I love carrot cake. But, but if you were diabetic and I told you that I had carrot cake and that you could eat all of it just because it had carrots in it, and, and I would be one of those people that would say that, by the way. I, I, I'd be lying to you, right? I mean, the implication is that everything that has carrots is good, right? Everything that has carrots in it, I mean, it, it has to be good. I mean, it's, it's a vegetable. So, so it has to be good because it's carrot cake. I mean, you know, it starts with carrot. Doesn't say sugar. But in reality, you know that if you're diabetic and you eat it all, there's going to be a problem. There's going to be a problem there, right? In the same way, not everything who, not every 
uh, not everyone who injects verses into motivational speeches is, is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know, I know this is not a... <laughs> I thought about, I was praying about this, I said, man, this is just, this is, this is a little hard. This is a little hard. But the, the fact of the matter is just because you hear the name of Jesus spoken in a motivational speech or somebody that can project the word and get excited and get motivated and they say Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that that is the word of God. This is the issue that was going on that was occurring in the early church. Paul was battling this issue within the church. And he has a spiritual son, his name is Timothy, and he warns him even in the beginning of the letter in regards to this type of teaching that there are false teachers within the church. And he urges them, he urges him to address these matters within the body of Christ. Within the body. So, so let me give you a more biblical example of, 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 of doctrine that is swayed away from the truth. False doctrine. Okay? We've heard this passage many times. I, I know I've quoted it many times. Maybe sometimes incorrectly. I have to check myself. And it is your responsibility to check me when I... When I read something, the scripture says in Jeremiah chapter 29, 11, and we've heard this many times. If I, I know the plans for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Right? We've heard that. We've heard that. And it appears that that is being addressed to an individual. Amen. Sounds like it's being addressed. Oh, God has plans for me, plans to prosper me. Plan but let, let's, let's read it in it. Let's understand it in its full context. So then we begin to understand. you got to read verses 12 and 13 that say, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Let me explain something. You have to understand that this is about Israel's disobedience and God's punishment. And they were, uh, they were in Babylon because of their disobedience. This is for specific restoration of the exiles. These were the exiles of, of Israel. And God is showing them that his discipline will bring obedience. That's what this is about. That's what this passage is talking about. It's talking about a group of exiles that, that are under the discipline of God. And God is saying, if you do these things, I will do this. He's not talking to a specific person. Right. Right. He's talking to a group of people that are right now in a, in a hardship in a, in a difficult moment in their lives, specifically to the nation of Israel. So sometimes when we hear things, they sound, they sound good immediately to us, but in reality, we have to look at the broader picture of what Scripture is teaching us, right? So the second question is this. Why is it important for us to identify false doctrine? Well, this is an issue that Paul was constantly on guard about. He taught Timothy constantly um, to guard against this. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, he says this, Remain at Ephesus mm -hmm. and ensure that certain people don't teach a different doctrine. Mm -hmm. He's telling them, listen, young preacher, you got, you got to be on guard. You got to be watching because people are trying to come in and deceive the flock. Right. They're trying to come in and bring separation and deceive the flock. This is not a new issue. It is not a new matter. And you might be here saying, well, we don't have to deal with that. We got Pastor Louis. We don't have to deal with false teaching. Yeah, but there's a lot coming in in a new and a different way. You know, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have the Internet. They didn't have Wi-Fi on every corner. They weren't, they didn't, uh, you know, they, 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 they didn't have accessibility to so much false teaching. It was there, but never like today. Never like today. And who will be the ones to discern this? So once, excuse me, let me get a little drink. Hallelujah. Thank you. So once false teaching was introduced into the body, it was very difficult to remove. Paul says this in the book of Galatians. He says, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. He's talking about False teaching. He's talking about false doctrine. You get a little bit in, it's hard to get that mess out. That, that's basically what he's saying. 
you bring a little bit of this type of sin in, and how do you distinguish once it's inside the church or once it's inside the mind? How do you? How, it's very difficult to sift through it and and separate the the bad teaching from the good teaching. So might as well be able to discern it before it even gets in. Amen. One of Jesus' greatest conflicts of his ministry was false teachers. I mean, we hear about it. We hear about the Pharisees, and we hear about the Sadducees, right? We hear about those two. They were, they were some of the greatest false teachers of their time. Amen. And Jesus, in Matthew chapter 16, it says, uh, Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the, Sa and the Sadducees, the leaven. Again, here we have that word again. In other words, it was, it was, it was difficult uh, to distinguish the truth from the false. It was, it was difficult. But once it was in, it started to grow. It started to, to expand. It started to, uh, to affect the, 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 what, the teaching of Jesus. And these were men that appeared to say the right things and do the right things, but they were corrupt, and they, were, uh, they weren't obviously corrupt. It wasn't obvious. When you saw them, you said, man, this, this, this man has it together. I mean, God is blessing him. He has the right car he's living in the right house he's saying the right things but 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 in reality there was teaching that was not right and he was not living right and so today we have that same spirit we have fat we, we think of pharisees and we think of legalism but it is not necessarily so because very often what it is 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 bad teaching is bad teaching that corrupts the church There are those people that are clearly wrong and others that use the truth to tell a lie. And which is worse, both are evil, but what is clearly wrong will not easily deceive. What, what is clearly wrong, I mean, if, if it's really wrong, I mean, we look at Jim Jones in hindsight. We look at Jonestown. For those of you who are old enough or remember, or I've seen the documentaries. We look at stories of false teachers that are blatantly wrong. And we look at them and we say, who would follow that? Somebody did. And, 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 and many died because of it. But for, for all practical matters, we look at certain groups and we say, that's obviously not true. That's obviously sin. That's obviously evil. It's obviously a lie, so I'm not going to follow them. But how about the ones that are more deceiving? The ones that, that use the word of God uh, to bring deception. Both are evil, but... What is clearly wrong is not, uh, is, will not easily deceive, but if there is just a little bit of truth injected, you will have a formula that can infect more in the body itself. In other words, once it's in the body, it's when it begins to affect. Amen. Paul said this, that it is through, well, let's look at verse chapter 6, verse, uh, six, verse 10. Let's look at the second part of that. And this is what he says, because I don't want... I want you to see it first before I say it. It says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. What Paul was really saying, can I say it? Can I say it? Dare I say it? Paul said that it is through this prosperity preaching. I'm, you still with me? Yeah. Okay. It is through this prosperity preaching that some have wandered away from the faith. In other words, they were in the faith. They, they were part of it, and they wandered away. Listen, I've experienced that. Like I said, just to give you background, I've experienced people that were dear to me, that I knew that were in the word, that were in the truth, people that can preach and teach, and they, they had gone, uh, they, they, they're no longer in church because they were they were hurt by these type of teachings and preachings that looked glorious and wonderful in the beginning but at the end they turned people completely away from the truth of Jesus Christ. Amen. I can I can I can sit here and name names. I can talk, I'm not going to do that. That's not my style. But I've seen it. I've seen it. And it is it is very relevant to this time. My concern as I see what what is going on right now again I, I don't believe that the church is, is dormant per se, but we don't have the accessibility to come into church to have 100 people or have 150 people in the church. So people are seeking. Where are they going to seek? And once they 
find that message and they like, they, their, their ears are being tickled, then what do we do? There's a challenge, and the challenge is to address those folks and tell them the truth so that they, as we discern it, as we can see it, that we can share <laughs> with them. So Paul addresses this, this situation. Obviously, he doesn't use the words prosperity preaching, but we can see it in verse 10. It's very clear that that's exactly what he's talking about in verse 10. This is not a new thing. This is not uh, you know, a, a just a 21st century, a 20th century uh, thing. This has been going on for the last 2,000 years. And although uh, you come to church and listen to the instructions of your pastor, now you have more voices than ever before. You have all of these different forms of media. So why is it important for us to identify false doctrine? So that we can limit these false teachings and come against them at the very root. Answer to the second question as we see it in scripture. Question number three. Let's answer that. How do I identify a false teacher? Well, Paul makes it extremely clear to Timothy. Paul wants Timothy to be able to identify these people in the church. And thank God he gives us this insight so that it is not just for the preacher. It is not just for the minister, but it is for the body in whole. He says this. Paul tells us clearly how to identify them. In verse 4, he says, this person is puffed up. He is conceited. He understands nothing. So in other words, this person is full of himself and self-centered. Quite often, this person will preach about himself leaving small traces of Jesus in the message. It is I-centric. It is it is about me. It is not Christ-centric, but it becomes about the individual. It becomes about him. It becomes about uh, letting you know how godly he is instead of about how godly the world or uh, how holy the God of the universe is. It, it, it changes on itself. And it sounds extremely convincing, but we have to have our eyes open. So Paul tells us very clearly, this person is puffed up. Do you know anybody like that? Have you heard any messages like that or from any preachers like that? Where they want to let you know that they are, hey, that, that, that they are the junk, man. That they got it together. That everything that they, that they it, it almost appears as if they can do no wrong. Wow. But the scripture says, Paul said that they understand nothing. In reality, they understand nothing. He go, goes on to say, as this person is, has an unhealthy craving for controversy. Listen to this. Listen, very important. This person has an unhealthy craving for controversy. As far as this person is concerned, they are being attacked by others. But in fact, their own actions lead them to controversy. The, the scripture tells us, in this world you will have trouble, troubles. And a lot of times you'll hear that. It, the, well, the, the Bible tells me in this world you will have troubles. But these are, are self-appointed troubles very often. In other words, they are, uh, they, you see them with controversy, and, and the, response to them, the, the response from them is, well, this is an attack from the enemy over the church. It's not an attack from the enemy. Wow. This, is, this is what you have brought upon the church of God. You have brought this division. You have brought this, this separation. Mm -hmm. And then people believe it. People believe it because, because they quote scripture. They they say certain things like, in this world you will have trouble. But in reality, the trouble has, you have brought trouble upon yourself and upon the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Is this too hard? <clears throat> he also, Paul also tells them that he quar they quarrel about words. <clears throat> this person will twist words to fit their needs at the pulpit and find new revelation mm. in words. In other words, they'll be, they, they, they could take a word and preach a whole message on that word. But in reality, when you look in Scripture, it is nowhere to be found in Scripture. They've, they've, they've built a whole message on, on a motivational word to bring to you and make you feel good. But it has no substance in Scripture. Uh, does anybody, has anybody heard anything like that? Amen. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I'm not alone up. <laughs> people will be impressed with their insight this is where you hear you be like, oh wow that was deep that, that was revelation that was deep and then you ask the person an hour later what, what did you receive oh it was good brother Woo! 
we received a good word today. What did you tell? What did he talk about? He just talked about the goodness of the Lord. And what else? You know what? What is what is the what specifically did, did, did he talk about? Amen. And it's it's Amen. just just to get you excited. Yes. So. This person knows how to use words and, and, and knows how to debate words and quarrels words, but yet, in reality, knows nothing. These very same words, according to Paul, will produce envy in the body, in that local body, okay, or among the leaders within that body. Those very same things will produce envy, dissension, Slant. I'm not making this up, by the way. This is this is this is in the scriptures. It's verse four. It's just in verse four. We're still just in verse four. So these things produce envy, dissension, slander, paranoia among the leadership. These things happen. I dare to tell you about an experience that I had that it hurt me dearly because I knew of a man of God, a pastor that I saw, and he saw a ministry that was so much greater than him that saw signs and wonders. And when he began to see those things, he said, no, I'm going to do that. And his ministry fell because of it, mm. because of this dissension, because of this envy, because of this slander and this, this paranoia. The, the church, the body of Christ was hurt. It, there's a constant friction. In verse 5, it says that there's a constant friction or a quarreling. Why? Why is this? Because their minds are morally corrupt and deprived of the truth. They're self-deprived of the truth that's right in front of them in the Word of God. They, they, their, their spirits are hungry for the, for the truth of the Word of God that is right in front of them, but, but yet they twist the Word to fit their own need. Are, are you following me? Verse 10 says this. I'm trying to get through this part real quick because this just seems so, it seems so hard. Verse 10 says this. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now listen, listen. This passage has been misquoted more than I think I would dare to say any scripture in, that, I, that I've ever heard. This is the way mo people, most, people normally say it. Money is the root of evil. It's not what the scripture says. Because if that, was the, if that was the fact, there would be no tithes, there would be no offerings, there would be no... The, the, you should not have money if money is evil. That's not what scripture says. Because it is through money, it is through money that we are able to do missions. It is through money that, that we are able to do the work of God. That is not what scripture says. The Bible does not say that money is evil. Let's, let's break it down real quick. It says, for the love... The love of money. In other words, for the worship of money. Right. You, you place money before God. And you can't get through a message without talking about money for, in, in these preachers. It, it's going to be there. Why? Because they love money. Because they love it. <laughs> and it says that it is a root. It is a root. It is not the root. It is a root. And it says of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say evil. In other words, it is not the evil thing in the world. So when we see, the, 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 and the reason why I emphasize that is because when we see these, many times these false teachers that always lead, according to Paul, according to Paul, these Teachers or these uh, these pastors or ministers always lead people to believe that it's all about the money. In other words, if God is blessing you, you will see it in your bank account. If God is blessing you, you're going to see it according to what you're driving. If God is blessing you, you're going to see it because you're going to have the right car. That's not that's not gospel. That that is not gospel truth. Because that, if in fact that is gospel, that means that all of my riches, that all that I have to look forward to is right here, right now. Forget what happens when I die. That, that resurrection does not matter, but, but in reality, it, it does. It does. So if I'm driving a Honda or if I'm driving a Hyundai or a Yugo, 
Nobody knows what a Yugo is. Y'all don't even remember. Anybody remember what a Yugo is? You in? If you, if you, if you, if you, well, regardless of what you're driving, you can be driving it and you can be absolutely blessed. Amen. You can be absolutely Amen. prosperous. Amen. Because it is not about what you drive. It is not about where you live. This is what Paul says to, uh, to Timothy. This is what Paul says to us. In verses 6 and 7, the last question that I want to answer, I'm, going, I'm, I'm working backwards now for the sake of uh, answering this question. What is the fruit or the result of sound doctrine? So what is the fruit and the result of us for, for understanding what sound doctrine is? It's this. <laughs> That we are content, verses 6 and 7, that we are content in the blessing of God and understand that we are greatly enriched in doing the will of God. Amen. That I am rich now. Right. Well, you don't look like you're rich. I know. Right. <laughs> but see, I know what awaits me. Amen. My riches and my treasures are not here. My, I'm working for my treasures in heaven. Amen. And, and by the grace of God, I don't work for my salvation. Mm -hmm. My salvation is free. It's right, that's been given to me. But as I worship him, as I seek him, as I, as, as I teach others about him, I know that God is going to bless me. Amen. I may not see that full blessing. As a matter of fact, I pray that I don't see that full blessing here. I know that a portion of it is here. Thank God. I, I, my salvation is for here and for now. And, and I know that I will receive fruit from that. But this, that's not the ultimate picture for me. Yes. There, there is something that is greater. There is something greater for you. Yes. So we can't look at that. People's ears are tickled over that when they hear that. If, you are, if, 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 God is, if, if, if God is with you, then you're blessed. And blessed means money. Not, that's not the gospel. That we have everything that we need in Christ right now. Everything that I need is right now, in the here and the now. That we are lacking nothing to accomplish his work in our life. There is nothing that I lack now to accomplish his work. The problem with the, with, with the false teaching and the false doctrine is that you are, God is going to take you there. You're going to get there. Brother, I don't need to get there. I'm here. There is a work for me to do now. There's a work for me to do here. Amen. So I don't need to be equipped. I have been equipped by the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he's called me to do. Amen. Are you following? Amen. So many times we hear these messages, it is always talking about what you're going to get, where God is going to take you. Well, let's talk about where, where I'm at. And where I'm at, I am content with. And that's what Paul is talking about, a sense of contentment. It is not that we are not going to that things are not going to be better in life, okay? But it is an understanding that where I'm at right now, I have everything that I need. There is nothing that I lack. We are not looking for the next best thing in when we're listening to the true gospel of Jesus Christ because we already have the best thing, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There is no measure of wealth that this world can offer me that is better than what Jesus has, is, and will give me in eternity. There's nothing. Nothing. I have everything. I have everything. There has to, there must be a sense of contentment about us that we understand. We understand that even according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that we are growing in Jesus through our sanctif sanctification. That we are being transformed, as, as scripture says, from glory to glory. In other words, as Christ sanctifies me while I'm here on this world, I have been saved by his grace through the resurrection and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. But God is still making me better. I'm not saying my bank account is growing. I mean, if it is, praise God, that means I can bless the church more. I can bless his work more. But in reality, it's not about that. So where does this leave us? This is where it leaves us. Let me, let me share with you quickly. That when we hear, when we hear people, or that when we're, when we're seeking ourselves sometimes, mm -hmm. 
you know, because the church is not open as much as it used to be. So we go to YouTube and we hear somebody preaching that we are able to discern first and foremost for ourselves what God is telling us. That we, we don't nearly, we don't simply listen for the, for the sake of getting our ears tickled, but for the, for the reality and the truth that is found in the word of God that edifies us for eternity and not for the moment. And second to that, that when we speak to people and that people speak to us, we are able to identify why do we fear? Why is our spirit telling us that this man or this woman is not the real deal? Mm. Well, well you're, you, I just shared with you how, how, how the, the, well, actually it wasn't even me. It was just Paul. I'm just telling you what Paul said. Amen. <clears throat> Paul tells us very clearly how to discern, how to clearly understand who is a false teacher? So that when we see that, you know what? You, you need to be careful because because really you, that, that person's really stuck on himself. Well, that, that's, that's, that's a little judgmental. That's, that's just not right. I mean, but listen to what he's saying. God calls us, listen, listen I'm just going to, God calls us to judge. Oh, I don't like that. Mm, I, I don't know about that. God, God calls us to judge, to discern within the body of Christ what is truth and what is not truth. Amen. God does not call us to judge unto salvation. That's not our job. But God does call us to judge. So my challenge to you, I believe the challenge of the Lord is to you is to judge carefully, judge discerningly what God, what is of God and what is not of God. So that we can draw, so that through him, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the people can be drawn to the truth of the word of Jesus Christ. Amen. Stand with me. Amen. Father, I believe we've been challenged today according to your word. Yes, to be able to discern what is of you and who is of you and who is not. Not for the purpose of mocking, not for the purpose of, 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 of putting down a man or a woman. That, that's not what you desire for us. But for the purpose of correction, for the purpose of, of edifying and building up your body. This is, this is why you want us to discern these things. Father, I pray that you would, you would seek our hearts for even those, maybe even in our lives, where we have heard messages and we have said, oh man, this is, this is for me. And we have been led astray, not, not away from our salvation, but away from your, your purpose in our lives for a moment. In this season, in this, in this hard season where, where we hear so many people telling us of the things that are, that are so wrong in our country and so wrong in this world that we ultimately look to you, that we are encouraged by you, that we are in your will, that we are in your purpose, Father God, that we are not following man, that we are not concerned about our bank account, that we understand that in you we have full contentment, yes. that this is, the me this is the true measure of the true gospel, of true teaching, Father God, that we know that you are for us. That you are not against us, dear Lord Jesus. Because your word teaches it. That it is not something that we need to look to in the future, but in the now, in the right now, Father, we have everything that we need. We have everything that we need. We have shelter. We have food. We have all that we need, Father. And we give you thanks. We glorify you. 